the Apple Silicon Mac Pro. Yeah, well, there's a lot. <laughs> I am looking forward to that for sure. Yeah, the raid boss of Apple's new M series of Macintosh computers. Just the biggest, the best, the baddest, the most expensive, and almost certainly the absolute last of Apple's chipset transition. So how will Apple's iPad-based system on a chip scale all the way up to what's currently a modular, massively multi-core Xeon and AMD graphics card capable monster? I have some ideas and I'm gonna tell them to you right now. Sponsored by Ting. What about in terms of a potential M-series Mac Pro? Uh, is there anything you'd like to see there? There's a couple far off tech products that I know are like years on the horizon. That's one of them that I'm very curious about. Honestly, I just wanna see that incredible optimization that Apple knows they can pull off that they've already started to see with their apps. Tons of power, of course, and just generally like a little bit more modularity because there's still a lot of questions about what, what sort of GPUs they're gonna have working with those Macs, what sort of upgradable RAM situation we'll end up with. But uh, I'm just looking forward to the performance gains at this point. That's the most exciting part for me. About the only rumor we've heard when it comes to the Apple Silicon Mac Pro is that it's gonna be shorter. Seriously, specifically from Mark Gurman of Bloomberg that it looks like the current design, but about half the size. And Mark's not sure if it'll replace the current Mac Pro the way the M1 MacBook Air just replaced the Intel MacBook Air or sort of slot alongside it the way the silver M1 Mac Mini created a new lower end tier beneath the existing space gray Intel Mac mini. Like maybe the increased power efficiency of the M series could lead to a reduction in the Mac Pro size, but the current Pro has that size because of all the expansion options it provides. Now, some of that current size is taken up by the honkingly big Intel Xeon processor, up to 28 cores of it and the AMD Radeon Vega Pro 2 graphics cards, up to two of them, and more on that in a 500 watt take minute. So first, that should give anyone and everyone just murder hornets level terrified that Apple will use M-Series as an excuse to go back to the trash can Mac, reason to just relax about it already. But second, depending on how Apple replaces all those Xeon cores, and maybe those graphics cards, it really could free up some space in the bottom of the Mac Pro chassis that they could take just right off the top. And of course, it also makes the kind of sense that absolutely does, given the investment Apple literally just, just made in the industrial design for the current Mac Pro. I mean, they went from the original translucent plastic tower to the cheese grater eons ago in computer time and stuck with the trash can just way past its prime it's really, really hard to see them moving on from cheese grater to great harder anytime soon. Smaller Mac Pro aside, the bigger question is just exactly how Apple's gonna power it all. I just imagine like the, like the difference between a smartphone sensor and like a, like a full frame sensor or a, a medium format sensor. If you can scale up Apple Silicon and see the performance gains in that way, if, I, if I'm, we're looking at a 28 core M10X or something, that could be pretty phenomenal. We've already seen the answer on the lowest and lowest power side, how Apple is replacing Intel's Core M Y series chipsets on the MacBook Air and like i5 U series on the most Air-like MacBook Pro and new silver Mac mini, basically all the integrated graphic stuff with a chipset that's a superset of the A14X. Four efficiency cores, four performance cores, seven or eight graphics cores, 16 neural engine cores, and more accelerators, controllers, and other custom silicon than you can throw a fab at. And I'm doing just a ton of coverage on all the Apple Silicon Macs from the M1 to what's still to come. So hit that subscribe button and bell and you won't miss any of it. The rumors for the next step up, what Apple will use to replace just the higher end i7 and i9 and discrete graphics, MacBook Pro, Space Gray Mac Mini, and some, maybe all of the iMacs are literally more of the same. Four E cores and 12 P cores, more of the same. Maybe, hopefully, more graphics cores as well. Basically, take Apple's senior vice president of hardware technologies, Johnny Saruji's graph, and follow the curve up from that 10 watt line to maybe past the 30 watt line. Way more performance, but still way more performance efficiency. There have been some rumors of an M1T as well, something that would go into the higher end iMacs. 
So whether that's, again, just more cores, like 16, who knows? Uh, I mean, who knows? But the Xeons, the Xeons in the iMac Pro, and more specific to this video, the Mac Pro, that is a deeper mystery. Because those aren't just massively multi-core, though they are that, they're designed to support more workstation, more enterprise specific environments and features like higher amounts of memory, but also error correcting ECC memory and just the general kind of robustness, resiliency and redundancy you need in really pro pro settings. And they don't usually care like one whit about more consumer friendly features like faster single core frequencies or integrated graphics because they're busy doing multiple heavy workloads, often headless in a rack or a production cart. And Johnny Saruji did announce a family of SOCs, a family of systems on a chip. But the question remains just how big the biggest member of that SOC family can get, at least right now for generation first. Would it just be throwing 24 or more P cores at the problem? Or is there a world where multiple SOCs in one device makes more sense? And would Apple want or need to use discrete GPUs either because maintaining GPU on package constrains them from scaling to the degree necessary, at least for now, or the Mac Pro simply demands the ability to do it off package to make graphics modular, even if that's no longer AMD and whatever comes after big Navi, not bigger Navi, but like Navi 3, and Apple is just spinning their own DGPU boards. There's been some speculation that Apple might do for graphics what they've just done for drivers, and that is move them out of kernel space and into user land extensions, if that's even necessary, and then use the same kind of MPX architecture that would let you just snap more graphics power, more cores into place and upgrade them over time, uh, given the limits of the space. Apple added two Thunderbolt controllers to the system on a chip for the M1, and it stands to reason they'll add even more, like maybe four for the M1X or whatever or however they scale that up. So it's not difficult to imagine they could surface the underlying PCIe lanes for MPX modules and other expansion, maybe ASIC like the afterburner cards that they're currently offering to accelerate ProRes performance. And once that architecture is built out, maybe could even form the foundation of a new generation of eGPU for MacBooks and the Mac mini as well. I mean, as long as I'm writing fanfic here. How all of that ties into or works with unified memory on the SOC, I don't know. It could just not, it could be ugly, or it could be something really, really clever. Maybe for memory as well, assuming they can't or just plain shouldn't keep up to 1.5 terabytes of RAM on package for something like a modular Mac Pro. If Apple could figure that part out, a way to make that 6K case super SOC powerful by itself, but considerably more extensible with a plug-in architecture, like what you get when you expand that Johnny Saruji curve to just the furthest, highest point possible on that graph. A revolution, maybe without compromise. Now, the T2 coprocessor in current Intel Macs is gone, dead, RIP, because that was basically a variant of the A10 processor anyway, just working around all the things Intel couldn't handle or Apple just didn't want them handling. Now, all of those IP blocks, all of those features are integrated and updated to the latest A series generation in the new M series. And while sure, that means Touch ID is still there for the MacBooks, it leaves biometrics still up in the air for the Mac Pro because you don't want the Touch ID sensor physically disconnected from the secure enclave. Apple has only ever included it on keyboards physically connected to the T2 or now M1 chip that houses that enclave. So putting Touch ID into something like the Magic Keyboard for Mac probably means having to put at least a T1 or T2 chip in that keyboard as well. An S2 Apple Watch or A10 iPhone equivalent chip in there as well, just to handle Touch ID authentication through a hardware channel, which would make for a more expensive keyboard. I mean, probably not iPad Magic Keyboard expensive, and it would be for a Mac Pro where expense isn't the primary concern. So I kind of hope Apple does just that. Also Face ID in an updated Pro Display XDR, because unlike the MacBooks and iMacs, the Mac Pro won't have a built-in camera above the display. Now they couldn't use a T1 or a T2, they'd have to use a T3 
based on an A-series processor that has the neural engine in it to support a feature like Face ID. But based on cost for a 6K display that costs around 6K, that's basically like a nickel in a bag of silver dollars at this point. Now, of course, some enterprise and even studio environments just wouldn't want a camera on anything, anywhere, anyway, but they don't have to buy the one with the camera. It can be for us. It's especially vexing at this point considering Touch ID launched in 2012 and Face ID in 2017. And it's just long past time Apple's basic biometrics came to their more advanced computer systems. Would any of this from far, far less expensive Apple Silicon relative to Intel and AMD and a smaller case because of higher efficiencies, would any of this lead to lower prices for the Mac Pro? Just you know, bringing it back down from the mid thousands to the lower mid thousands of the previous starter models. But what I hope Apple does do is what they've been doing increasingly on their other lines. And that is continue to drive down the entry level price. Yes, even on something like the Mac Pro and then using the higher end prices as a way to fit in that more new advanced technology. And anyway, Apple has said it will take up to two years to complete the switch from Intel to M series custom silicon in the Macs, specifically for the Mac Pro. And while they may get it done in one year, like the previous PowerPC transition, you still may want to start saving for it now with Ting. Because whether you want only a little data or all of it, unlimited, Ting has a perfect plan for you and your family. You can get talk and text for just 10 bucks a month, data from 15 bucks, five gigabytes for 25, unlimited from 45. Whatever you need, just go to renee.ting.com to check out the plans and see how much you can save. You get access to the best nationwide coverage in America on pretty much any phone, from the iPhone 12s, all of them, to the Galaxy flips and folds, the pixels, pretty much anything you can put a SIM card in. And you can keep your existing phone, keep your existing number too if you want to. Because the next generation of Ting Mobile is here. And seriously, just see how much you can save and get $25 off. Go to renee.ting.com, click on the link below or go to renee.ting.com and get $25 off. And clicking on that link just really helps out the channel. For a ton more on Apple Silicon and the M1 Max, click the playlist above. I've got in-depth reviews and comparisons detailing every single new feature and so much more to come. So click on that playlist and I'll see you in the next video.